Only a few miles from the dark swamps are these pristine beaches and, and the bustling boardwalks of the South Carolina coast. Myrtle Beach is about 75 miles of beach, white sandy beaches, very coastal, low-lying areas, a lot of swamps and rivers, uh, and the intercoastal waterway connected. We have everything you'd want in a vacation destination. We've got the beach, we've got activities, we've got shows, we've got a lot of golf and tennis. We get 20 million tourists a year. We get a lot of transplants from the New York area, New Jersey, and then we have locals as well who have been born and raised here. The actual permanent population of Myrtle Beach is more like around 30,000. So this is still a really small town. Conway, I think it catches a lot of people off guard. I think they think Myrtle Beach is kind of all that's here. I call it small town USA. It's a nice little three block downtown. Everything's kind of that red brick that you picture when you drive in. And it's just got a slower feel than Myrtle Beach. When I first came down to Myrtle Beach to report on this story, one of the things that I noticed first was this great divide between the tourists who live on the coast and the locals who live west of the intercoastal inland. And it was there that in December of 2013, a young woman, just 20 years old, Heather Elvis, disappears. When people talk about Heather, they smile because she was so full of personality. She lit up a room when she walked in. She was precious. She had a wonderful life. She had a beautiful life. She lived it the way she wanted. She made her choices the way she wanted. We've always been a, a, a tight-knit family. Everybody does for everybody else. I would describe Heather as outgoing, free spirit, you know, love and life. She always wanted to live life to the fullest. She loved to make up. She wanted to be in front of the camera and behind the camera and design everything that she wore in front of the camera. She didn't understand boundaries when it came to dreaming. Heather Elvis worked at a restaurant, a sports bar here called the Tilted Kilt. Tilted Kilt is an Irish-Scottish version of Hooters. So the girls wear kilts. It's like a sports bar, so they have TVs everywhere. They have a whole bunch of different beers on tap. Heather was a hostess at Tilted Kilt, where I was a manager. She was friendly to everybody. She's always smiling. She had a contagious laugh that I would love to hear again. Heather and I worked at Tilted Kilt together. Um, I actually helped her get that job. I talked to the managers and said they should bring her on, that she's a really great young woman. and that she definitely, she'd be a great addition to the team. It wasn't the most appropriate of uniforms, but at that age, you do what you can to rebel against your parents. <laughs> Heather really didn't give a crap what anybody thought about her. Huh. She was a very free spirit, and she expressed herself how she wanted to, and she might have come off abrasive to some people, but she was just, she was very real. It's and funny because she looks like such a kid in those pictures. <laughs> she, she looked like she such was tiny. a young... She was tiny. She was tiny. She was just 20 like, years I, old. And I she feel like young. I'm a short woman, but she, <laughs> she made me feel tall. She yeah. was very tiny. And yet, there was a big personality. Very big personality. That. When you're young in Myrtle Beach, you don't think <clears throat> that bad things are going to happen. It came out of the blue. No one expected this to happen. But at about 4 a.m. on December 18th, that early morning, an Horry County police officer was on a routine patrol when he noticed that empty car in the parking lot. He got out because it was suspicious that there's a car there this time of night. There's no lights. There's nobody around. He gets out, he checks the vehicle. There doesn't appear to be anything out of the normal, so he then gets back and continues patrolling. The next day, someone reported that car as a suspicious vehicle because of the length of time it had been sitting at Beach Street Boat Landing. At that time, Officer Canterbury goes down and sees the car, runs the tag. When he runs the tag, he finds it belonged to Terry Elvis. I think I was sitting in the living room and I 
had a knock at the door. And Debbie went to the door. And I, I saw through the window that it was uh, a county police officer. And uh, he was asking if we were missing a car. And I remember both of us looking in the driveway. Like, no. And he says, uh, a green Dodge Intrepid. Oh, yeah, that's Heather's car. And then he goes on to explain that it's been found uh, at Peachtree Landing, apparently abandoned. He asked if I had keys to it, and I said, yeah. He said, let's ride down and take a look. By the time we got there, it was dark. And uh, he pulled in, had his lights on the back of the car, and shined his spotlight on it. He says, that is? I said, yeah. So we got out to go take a look. Mr. Elvis uh, immediately suspected something was wrong. He knew that that was his daughter's only mode of transportation. It had no business being at that landing. She never went to that landing. I was just sitting there twiddling my thumbs and waiting, calling Heather's phone. It was going straight to voicemail, which is way out of character with Heather. I thought the car might have been stolen because of the way it was parked. Maybe somebody took it and left it there. It really didn't hit me. Where's Heather? Uh, until he started looking through things. Clothes, art, shoes, purses, makeup, you name it, was in her car. But they don't find her phone. They don't find her wallet. They don't find a pocketbook. I could see the worry on his face. Uh, that's when I, I got worried. After we looked inside the car, he says, uh, let's look in the trunk. And I think even though I still thought the car was stolen, I, I could feel my heart just drop. Tonight, near 40 inland, we'll be in the mid-40s right along the immediate coast. First, I thought the car was stolen, and now we're opening the trunk. Well, I was panicking and pacing the floor while he was at the landing. So I put the key in and turn it and open the trunk, and I look away. Heather's phone is an extension of herself, and it was always in her hand or very close by, and for her not to answer the phone wasn't right. And he said, it's just stuck, and it wasn't. We closed the trunk back, and uh, he looks around the perimeter of the landing. He walks around the edge, just looking into the woods and along the edge to see if there's anything out of place. And everything looked normal. When they got back to Mr. Elvis's house, he knew how to access the phone records for the family. While Heather lived on her own, she was still very dependent on her father. Um, she was on his phone plan still. She still drove his vehicle, so he had access to these things. He was able to produce those records for Officer Canterbury. My panic had really set in because it's totally out of the ordinary. You know, Heather's never done anything like this before. Something's wrong, but what's wrong? That's when police began piecing together the last known movements of Heather on the night she disappeared. So, December 17th, Heather went on a date with Steve Schiraldi. Like Heather, 21-year-old Stephen Schiraldi was active on social media, posting selfies and chatting with friends. It was actually on Instagram that he connected with Heather. Stephen and Heather had gone to high school together. <laughs> And I believe Stephen asked her out on a date, and she agreed to go. She was looking forward to that date very much. Stephen says they went to dinner at a place called Bandito's. After dinner, they went to an abandoned parking lot at a shopping mall, where Stephen taught Heather how to drive a stick shift truck. We were watching TV, and I got a text. And uh, it was a picture of Heather driving uh, a small pickup truck. 
a big smile on her face. It was a picture of her driving Steve's truck. Just below it, she had written, learn to drive a stick. Ha, ha, ha. Because it was a sore point. Uh, I had tried to teach her how to drive a stick shift. You're proud and aggravated at the same time. Yeah, but yeah, it was it was pride. Heather went to Stephen's house briefly to watch a movie. His mother corroborates that, and then Stephen took her home. He said he took her back to the apartment, dropped her off, and went home, and said that they'd either text or talked. You know, after that, a couple of times for a few minutes. Police across the country know that in any missing persons case, the first 48 hours are absolutely critical. Right now, they're leaving no stone unturned. And as part of this initial investigation, they send an officer over to the tilted kilt to see if Heather had missed work. One of the first things that investigators hear from Heather's co-workers is that there is a different man who they should be talking to, other than the man Heather went on a date with the night before. The manager said she's not working until tomorrow, but you really need to call Sydney Moore. There had been a relationship between the two of them. Sydney Moore, back in 2013, was a night maintenance man at various miscellaneous restaurants along the Grand Strand, one of which being the Tilted Kilt, which is where he met Heather Elvis. Heather and Sydney started talking. They noticed each other when he would start doing little things around Tilted Kilt. She noticed that, you know, he was good looking, he had a good attitude, and she, she went for it. Now, he may have been good looking, but he was 37, which made him 17 years older than Heather Elvis. Sydney and Heather's relationship was certainly sexual in nature. I think that was a big driving force in that relationship. Sydney and Heather were having sex all the time, anywhere that they could. There were allegations that there was sex in the restaurant nearby during work hours, everything else. That did not make me happy whatsoever. So I did ask her about it. I confronted her about it. What was the actual nature of their relationship? I mean, most people would call it a sexual relationship, but from my opinion of talking to her, they were in love. How long was it before that everybody knew that they were an item? Uh, I want to say it, it was probably like the end of summer, early August, maybe. Having known Heather since we were little, it was a little surprising, but Heather was always a risk taker. She was pretty rebellious. She was one of those people when you told her no, it only wanted to make her do it more. She always wanted what made her happy. So I guess Sydney just made her happy when yeah. they were together. And like so many other people Heather's age, she shared her thoughts and her musings on social media, whether she was happy or sad, and she did so pretty frequently. I think for any 20-year-old, there's a strong uh, social media presence and used it for everything, and that's their main form of communication. They're on Twitter, they're on Facebook, and there's not a great filter there. Heather did enjoy social media, and I think that that was one place where she could express herself openly and wouldn't be judged for it. There's no telling what would come out of that girl's mouth. <laughs> she uh, she posted a lot of a lot of off the wall things, you know, at random times of the day. Sydney would sometimes come to bring her coffee and bagels, not to do a job, but literally just to bring her something. Yes. Did you find that charming? It was cute, even though we all thought that it was wrong <laughs> on so many levels. I knew that she was talking to a boy named Sydney, uh, that he was sweet and she was smitten. <laughs> I had no idea he was married. I'm your nightmare while your flies asleep. Heather received a phone call and it was Tammy on the other end and she said, I know you're with my husband. And revenge has never felt so sweet. At this point, Heather was missing, and they don't really know where she's at. However, they do know that she was having an affair with a married man who also worked at the Tilted Kilt by the name of Sidney Moore. Being bad has never felt so good. We learned all about it in just that first little short period of time because everybody who wanted to help 
told us everything, more than we wanted to know, really. When you're in love, you're in love. When you're 20, you don't always necessarily think through all of those things. Doing bad things to you. Sidney Moore was 37 years old, he had three kids, and he was married to a 40-year-old woman named Tammy. She was nearly twice Heather's age. Tammy and Sidney Moore were married over 15 years. When I got involved in this case, they had a son that was around 15, a daughter that was around 13, and another son that was around 10 or 11. Tammy Moore was definitely the more domineering part of that couple. She told Sydney where to work, when to work, what to do. Uh, if I would classify Sydney as anything in that relationship, it would be utterly submissive. They both had jobs at night or they worked at night. They would sleep during the day. They were homeschooling their children. So literally you could live in Myrtle Beach and never even run across these people. Prior to this affair, Sydney did have another previous affair. I think Tammy, being the domineering person she was, always was suspicious of Sydney, especially after the first affair he got caught having. It wasn't a secret to those that worked at the kill. Um, you know, we all knew about it. The affair between Sydney Moore and Heather Elvis was the worst kept secret in Horry County. By now, Heather's relationship with Sydney had been going on for about three months. And there were lots of folks who worked at the Tilted Kilt with her who felt that this relationship had just crossed the line. There were definitely people that we worked with at the Tilted Kilt that did not agree with Sydney and Heather's relationship. One day, two of the girls decided to call the Tilted Kilt and pretend to be Tammy, Sydney's wife. I don't know if they were jealous, if they were upset that she was dating a married man. They decided to make a pregnant phone call and said, this is Tammy Moore, I know about you and my husband, I need you to stop right now. And when Heather got that phone call, she totally freaked out. After that prank call, co-workers say that they didn't see Sydney coming around Heather anymore. Then by the end of October 2013, Sydney and Heather's relationship completely unraveled when Tammy found out for real this time about their affair. And it's at this point that Tammy confronted Heather. Heather received a phone call and it was Tammy on the other end and she said, I know you're with my husband essentially, like I know you've been sleeping with my husband. Sydney got on the phone and said, you were just some girl that spread your legs. He pretty much belittled Heather and made it seem like it was nothing and that he just used her for a booty call. Heather was crying because they broke up and she was very upset about it. After Tammy found out about the affair, she was absolutely livid. She did um, call Heather a lot, text Heather a lot. Someone's about to get their beat down. She was posting a lot of disparaging comments on social media, and Heather was legitimately terrified. You can tell me who you are right now, or I will find out another way. Nobody you need to worry about anymore. And what did they say, do you remember? Oh, she was threatening her. Hey, sweetie, you ready to meet the missus? Basically just letting her know that she was there and she knew. And what did she say? Are you ready to meet the missus? That doesn't sound that bad. Well, she did mention something about Sydney taking his last breath. Your bitch is about to take his last breath. And Tammy was relentless. She would call her nonstop for hours and hours and hours. She would call off Sydney's phone. The breakup between the two of them was nasty. It didn't go down well. Um, it ended with threats. I'm giving you one last chance to answer before we meet in person. Only one. She was sending pictures of her and Sydney performing sexual acts, videos of you know the two of them together, I guess kind of to taunt Heather. Heather didn't shy away from responding. I think you're a little obsessed with me. <laughs> nah, it was a bore. She, I don't want to say, Push Tammy's buttons, but certainly didn't just brush it off. Really? So that's why you're still childishly texting me from your cheating husband's phone? Your skank needs to leave me alone. Were you concerned for Heather, or was Heather concerned after those text messages came in? Heather was definitely freaked out. I think she was 
terrified of her. I mean, her her demeanor completely changed over the next few weeks. Like she was, she was very paranoid. Heather was genuinely scared. Like she didn't want to ever see Tammy. In September 2013, Heather wrote on her Twitter page, once upon a time, an angel and a devil fell in love and it did not end well. She probably was referring to her in Sydney. Heather just kept saying, leave me alone. Leave me alone, I don't want anything to do with this. And the calls did stop. Finally, they did stop. Once Tammy finds out about this affair, the Moors take a road trip all the way out to California. But this is after purchasing a brand new black F-150. It was a three week trip. So it was a lot of time together. They drove all the way to California and drove back. According to the Moors, the purpose of the trip was to reconcile their marriage. Heather was heartbroken. It took a few weeks for Heather to kind of come back around to become that bubbly type person. Heather started coming back to her normal self, always joking, always laughing, giggling, pulling pranks on people, the Heather that we've always known and loved before October. By the beginning of December, there was no communication between Heather and the Moors. Heather was really looking forward to her future after putting everything to rest with Sydney. By all accounts, Heather had moved on. She was dating again. In fact, on the night she disappeared, she was out on a date with someone new. But now, Heather was gone and gone without a trace. And police went to the Tilted Kilt, and that's where they were tipped off about Heather's affair with Sidney Moore. So the police immediately go to Sidney's house. They talk with him in December 20th, early morning, I'd say 2 a.m. Yes. When's the last um, it's either last night or night before, I can't remember. And what's your relationship with her? There is no relationship. There, previous there relationship? was a relationship. I broke it off. So he was trying to give the police this idea of, look, I'm over her. I haven't reached out to her. I don't know where she is. I've had zero contact with her. At any point, did you go down around the Peach Tree landing there? Yep. So there's nothing that's going to show up? Yeah. you want to say if she happens to be watching right now heather if you're watching this if you can see it if you can hear it we miss you but we want you home tell me where you're at oh come it doesn't, <clears throat> doesn't matter where doesn't matter when doesn't matter why just tell us where you're at We begin tonight with a developing story in Horry County as a 20-year-old Saugusty woman is missing. I'm Allison Floyd. And I'm Tim McGinnis. Tonight, police are investigating her disappearance. WPDE News Channel 15's Kayla Dorenzo joins us live from Peachtree Landing in Saugusty, where the woman's car was found. And Kayla, what's been going on out there all day? Tim and Allison, according to the Horry County Police Department, Heather Elvis's car was found in this parking lot here at Peachtree Landing on Thursday, but she hasn't been seen in nearly three days. And today, crews were out here searching for any any signs that may point to exactly where she is. Originally, this case was just assigned out as a missing person. We did not know or have any reason to believe a crime had been committed in the beginning. The car showed no sign of a struggle. There was no blood, no broken glass, nothing to believe that a crime had been committed. Detectives are continuing to investigate the situation. So while crews were searching for any physical trace of Heather at Peachtree Landing, police were combing through her phone records. And almost immediately, they noticed an unusual number of calls to an unfamiliar number. They then found out the number belonged to a payphone. And that the payphone had called her phone that very early hour of 1.35 AM. 
and then she immediately is calling the payphone back. Heather dials that payphone back nine times. Not eight, but nine times. The only reason she could possibly be calling that phone nine times that she's never heard of before is to get the other person that just talked to her back on the line. They find that the payphone has surveillance video. They pull the surveillance video. It was very grainy. He, an individual, walked to the payphone. He owned the payphone over five minutes. Even though they didn't know who it was, they had evidence then that the payphone had been used. They call Sidney Moore back. They bring him into the police station for a more formal interview. Horry County Police begin questioning Sidney about his whereabouts on December 18th, and he tells them that he and his wife, Tammy, were going around doing errands. And at one point, they stopped at a Walmart. Was that Walmart actually? In Myrtle Beach. Myrtle Beach Walmart. Myrtle Beach Walmart. Yeah. Was yeah. your wife with you yes. the whole time? Yeah, she was with me the whole time. They asked him about the pay phone call. Had you used any other phones that night? Your wife's phone? No. Did you make any pay phone calls? Nope. I still have pay phones. Who makes a phone call today from a pay phone? Sydney Moore has a cell phone. Tammy Moore has a cell phone. And Tammy Moore used that cell phone to great length to harass and essentially stalk Heather Ellis. They were calling from a pay phone to hide the call. There was a phone call made to Heather that night from a pay phone at the gas station on 10th Avenue. Okay. But we have video from that. Okay. Did you try calling her just a minute? No. A second? You sure? Maybe. Okay, how about we start again? I, I did. I called her from okay, the pay phone. What did you say? I asked her to please leave me alone. It sounded like a very innocent explanation, but Heather's roommate, Brianna, tells police a very different account of that phone call. At 1.44 in the morning, she called me. I was on winter break from college in Florida. She was hysterically crying, and she said, Sydney called me. My heart dropped because I was like, I thought we were past this. I said, why'd you answer? And she said, because it wasn't his number. She told me that he said he left his wife and that he was sorry and that he wanted to see her and be with her. And I told her, don't do it. Why don't you go to sleep, sleep on this and we'll talk about it first thing in the morning. When Heather and I hung up that night, by the end of the phone call, I was under the assumption that she wasn't going to meet Sydney. That's when everything starts moving in a very different direction. After interviewing Heather's roommate, Brianna, about that conversation that Sydney and Heather had on the payphone, police begin by reconstructing the movements of Tammy and Sydney that night. They begin by pulling security video from that Walmart in Myrtle Beach. Sydney spent approximately nine minutes inside that Walmart, then went and got back in the truck where Tammy was waiting outside. After that, they drove directly to the payphone where you see Sydney make the call to Heather Ellis. Day 20 in the search for missing 20-year-old Heather Elvis. Dozens of cars and horse trailers line the heavily wooded area. While teams of volunteers continue to search for any trace of Heather, police are now squarely putting the focus of their investigation on Sydney and Tammy. But rather than lend a hand in the search, Sydney and Tammy unleash an online tirade against the missing 20-year-old. The Moore's big push was to basically discourage anybody that was looking for Heather Elvis. They had a lot of negative things to say about the victim. Tammy and Sydney Moore were vicious at times on social media. I mean, Tammy Moore put out a Facebook post shortly after she went missing, calling her a whore, saying these terrible things. We've all heard the term a woman scorned, right? And that's Tammy Moore was. She, but when you see these posts and you see the way she's behaving as an adult woman, a mother with three kids, the way she's hounding this 20-year-old kid, it's disturbing. It was a social media war, a campaign of pure terror. This case was the perfect storm for two families that were very outspoken, very motivated, and they weren't going to give up either side. 
Using Heather's phone records and her Gmail account, investigators began to piece together her movements. After that phone call from Sydney at 1.35 a.m., Heather ends up calling his cell phone several times between 3.17 a.m. and 3.21 a.m. Finally, he picks up and the two have a conversation for about four minutes. And it's at that point that Heather gets in her car and begins driving. We trace Heather's phone all the way to Peachtree Boat Landing. And once she gets to the landing, she's again calling Sydney Moore. 337, 338, 339, 340. It was four phone calls right in a row. This is why this is important, because while Heather was making those phone calls, video surveillance cameras along the route to Peach Tree Landing also show a black pickup headed in the same direction. Right there is the camera that caught what the FBI and the prosecutors say is that Ford F-150 going south towards Peachtree Landing. At 3.41 a.m. is when Heather's cell phone goes dead. There's nothing else at the end of that road but Peachtree Landing and Heather Elvis. I think any time you have a missing person, the pressure on law enforcement is immense. Not so much from the community, but you have a family that's missing a daughter, and they wanted to find her. We had the payphone call, which still wasn't enough. Then we kind of had to chase down what Sydney Moore told the police to find out what was true and what wasn't true. During this time frame, we also started beginning looking for surveillance footage along 814 and Mill Pond Road. When you look at a map, it's immediately clear that driving Highway 814 and Mill Pond Road is the quickest way connecting Peach Tree Landing and Tammy and Sydney Moore's house. In fact, they're only four miles apart. So right up here is a surveillance camera that captured the image of a truck that looked very much like the one owned by Sydney and Tammy Moore driving towards Peach Tree Landing. There's nothing else at the end of that road but Peach Tree Boat Landing and Heather Elvis. Heather's phone dies, and then you see the truck immediately coming back across the same two cameras, heading back to the Moore's residence. So assuming that whoever was doing this was roughly driving the speed limit, they only had about 60 seconds at Peach Tree Landing to do whatever they were going to do and get back on this road in time to be captured by those surveillance cameras at 3.45 a.m. At the time, Sydney Moore and Tammy Moore own a 2014 Ford 150 truck. Horry County Police Department found there was only one, and it was Sydney Moore, who also happened to be the only person that lived that close to the landing owning that truck. Once investigators discovered that apparent link between Heather's disappearance and Tammy and Sydney Moore, they pay a visit to their house. Originally, when the officer showed up at Tammy and Sydney Moore's house on December 20th of 2013, they noticed that there were cameras up outside the house. The goal after they saw that security system was to get a search warrant. However, once they went back, they found out that the surveillance system in there was a new system and that it had not recorded anything on December 18th of 2013. They had no idea what was on the new system, but they knew that they, out of an abundance of caution, they needed to seize that system. Investigators also scoured the Moore's black pickup truck looking for clues, and they made an important discovery. It was a brand new F-150, fully loaded, had all the bells and whistles. In this truck was a GPS navigation system. We learned that it was possible to disengage this system, and that's exactly what they did. It's like a camera SIM card. You push down, it'll pop out. When you take it out, warnings will show up all over your vehicle. So it could not have been a mistake. It had only been taken out once, and that was the night she went missing. Two months later, the police arrested Sydney Moore and Tammy Moore. They told us 
that morning that they were going to do it. They actually had uh, officers come and sit with us at home uh, to make sure that we were there, we were protected, and we knew what was going on. Sydney Moore and Tammy Moore were the two people that were taken into custody earlier this morning. The breakthrough in the case came from a discovery made by Elvis's father. He says after he looked up her cell phone records. That number, the parents telling ABC News, belonged to 38-year-old Sydney Moore. It was a relief to know that something was getting started. We're going to begin with a break in the case of a young woman who simply vanished. Two people have been taken into custody. Both Sydney and Tammy Moore are being held here at the J. Reuben Long Detention Center. Immediately in this case, the defendants, the victims, everyone went to social media. It was like wildfire. It spread exponentially in, in a matter of hours. What began as a case dividing two families who lived just five miles apart quickly consumed the entire town. At this point, it seemed like everyone had an opinion. It seemed the whole town took sides. This was probably the first case where the social media took on a life of its own. I don't think anybody had seen anything like this case. I never experienced anything like it, where there were so many so-called facts that came from somewhere but did not come from a police investigation. The state asked for and the judge granted them a gag order. The order prohibits all parties, including defendants, prosecutors, and law enforcement agencies from speaking to the media. And because of the severity of the alleged crime, Tammy and Sidney Moore were denied bail and sent to jail for almost 12 months. We then had another bond hearing in February of 2015. At that time, Judge Dennis decided to allow them to be out on an ankle monitor. It was just a very traumatic time, so it, we were in a fog. Prosecutors decided to try Sydney and Tammy separately. So Sydney goes on trial first in 2016 for the kidnapping of Heather Elvis. Now, prosecutors are not required to show motive when they try a case, but they do understand that motive often helps juries understand the background and what's really going on. And in this particular case, prosecutors were not going to disappoint that jury. In the weeks before Heather Elvis goes missing, she puts on noticeable weight. A fellow co-worker at the Tilted Kilt, which provides the uniforms to the employees, mentions that her bra size goes up. She went from an A cup bra to a B cup bra than a B to a C. I mean, that's the kind of thing that typically happens when someone is pregnant. Yes, definitely. And remember that errand that Sydney ran at the Walmart the night Heather disappeared? He made two purchases, and he paid in cash. The motive was absolutely that Heather was pregnant. I think she was carrying his child, and she... I'm gonna do at 4 o'clock in the morning, Peachtree Boat Landing is a dark, desolate place. There is no reason for a car to be there abandoned in the middle of the night. We begin tonight with a developing story in Horry County as a 20-year-old Sockistee woman is missing. A 20-year-old woman in an affair with a 37-year-old man. She was smitten. Uh, I had no idea he was married. Heather wrote on her Twitter page, once upon a time, an angel and a devil fell in love and it did not end well. His wife sent text after text. Just threats after threats. It wasn't pretty. After Tammy found out about this affair, they literally stalked Heather Ellis. They were chasing her. We are here because she can't be. Then a second look at images from a security camera. That is when prosecutors dropped a bombshell that nobody saw coming. There was a gasp in the room. I was just like, holy crap, this is it. Why would a defendant defy a court order just hours before she's set to testify? She is so narcissistic, I don't think she could help it. A missing daughter, a love affair, and a dark road that for her only went one way.
Tilted Kilt knew about Sydney and Heather's relationship. It wasn't a secret. At least to any of us, it wasn't. So in the weeks before Heather Elvis goes missing, she puts on noticeable weight. The uniform is a bra, a shrug, and a skirt. So there's three separate pieces that you can move up in sizes. She went from an A-cut bra to a B-cut bra, then a B to a C, and then the skirt went from a medium skirt to a large skirt. Heather had taken a pregnancy test while at work. I want to say it was the beginning of November, and she wasn't sleeping with anyone else other than Sydney. When she took the test, it came up error. I didn't really know if she was pregnant or not. I think it was kind of up in the air. If she's pregnant and it's Sydney's child, that certainly throws a new wrinkle into this story. I think it was in the beginning hard to imagine that two people like Tammy Moore and Sydney Moore would take the life of a young girl. So you felt like there had to be something more and we believed that it was because Tammy Moore thought she was pregnant. So initially, when the Moors were arrested, they were charged with murder in addition to kidnapping. Kidnapping in South Carolina means to decoy, inveigle, or take another individual. So even the phone call from the payphone that Sydney made to decoy her out was kidnapping. That murder charge was later dropped. I assume, given the lack of physical evidence in this case, no body, no blood, no murder weapon, that it would have been hard to prove for the state. The trial of the man accused of kidnapping Heather Elvis is now underway. I sat in that room and I thought that by the end of the week, if things went the way that we wanted them to, it would be like this release. Thank you, Your Honor. This time the state calls Jessica Cook. <laughs> One of the first witnesses we actually called to the stand was Jessica Cook. Jessica was one of the managers at the Tilted Kilt where Heather worked. Do you ever notice any changes in her physical appearance? Yes. Remember that video of Sydney at the Walmart the night of Heather's disappearance? Prosecutors think they know why he was there. On that video, it shows uh, Sydney Moore in his truck, F-150, driving to a handicapped parking spot, exit his vehicle, walk into the Walmart, the seat showed that he had purchased a pregnancy test and uh, a cigarette-type cigarette, and he paid cash. The conjecture is that they're gonna take it to Heather and make her take a pregnancy test. I think that if she was pregnant, I think that would be another reason why Tammy would want Heather out of the picture. According to Sydney, the reason he went to that Walmart was to buy a pregnancy test for his wife, Tammy. He insisted that they were trying to have another baby. There was no hard evidence of guilt to me. There was a bunch of bad character evidence, and there was a tremendous amount of circumstantial evidence. Now, tell this story about how old you are. Prosecutors built what they believed was a very convincing case, knowing that asking a jury to convict based solely on circumstantial evidence is always a steep hill to climb. I think the surveillance footage was absolutely key, and that goes from the Walmart to the payphone to the truck going down and coming back because it created a timeline that showed everything, all attention was on Tammy Moore and Sydney Moore, and everything they did was very deliberate towards Heather Elvis. Have a question, John. Very well, thank you. When the state rested, I felt pretty good about it. And if the jury required proof beyond a reasonable doubt, we were in good shape. So we did not put up a defense at that point. The whole thing is traumatizing. The most traumatizing thing about all this is not knowing where our child is. Everybody was just kind of waiting. I think most people thought it'd be several hours for a verdict. We're like, this is a slam dunk. But it wasn't. The jury is still deadlocked and will be unable to resolve it. Therefore, I'll declare a mistrial. This case will have to be tried again. To say that I was shocked that Sidney Moore got off on a hung jury would be putting it mildly. I think all of us were wondering, what now? What do we do from here? 
The hung jury was a painful blow to the prosecutors and the Elvis family, and prosecutors were convinced that Tammy and Sidney were responsible. But getting answers about what happened to Heather remained the priority. Investigators felt sure that the Moors knew more than they were telling, and they thought that maybe if they pressured them hard enough, long enough, one of them would begin cooperating with authorities. Sidney Moore then is charged with obstruction of justice for lying to police during the investigation. It's over the payphone call where he's on video denying it, and then, yeah, we all know he made that phone call. I know that Sidney Moore misled the police from the very get-go, and we felt like this is a missing girl, and the first 48 hours are so important. So that's why we decided to move forward with the trial. It only took the jury 50 minutes to decide. On the charge of obstruction of justice, he He's found guilty of obstruction of justice and sentenced to 10 years in prison. The Elvis family says today's verdict is the beginning, not the end. I think it'll be like dominoes. I think the first one fell. I think the rest will fall into place. Um, you can't hide it forever. While prosecutors fell short in their bid for a guilty verdict in Sydney's trial, they learned an important lesson. They needed more evidence. With Tammy's trial on the horizon, prosecutors felt very confident that a conviction in that case would bode very well for the retrial of Sydney. If getting answers about Heather was paramount, investigators understood that first, they had to figure out who the mastermind was. If I had to pick a ringleader, it was definitely Tammy Moore. She had the motive. He had the means and opportunity. If it wasn't for Tammy Moore, Heather Elvis would be here. It's not often that a defendant in a felony case sits down to tell their side of the story without an attorney present on the night before they're expected to testify. Not to mention violating a gag order on them, but that's exactly what happened. Put it out dead center. About right there, Scott. As you probably expect, we're going to go through a lot of stuff, right? I'm also going to ask you tough questions, which I'm sure you're bracing yourself for. I haven't no. braced at all. When a family member or a friend goes missing, it's like a part of you goes missing with them. Well, it's been nearly five years since Heather Elvis disappeared. Today, the trial for one of the suspects, Tammy Moore, started. And you knew there was a price to pay. In October 2018, Tammy Moore went to trial for conspiracy to kidnap Heather Elvis and kidnapping Heather Elvis. We are here because she can't be. And she can't be here because she decided she can't be here. Prosecutors have never before made a clear link between Elvis and Tammy Moore, and her attorney says there is no link that can be made. Because Tammy Moore didn't kidnap any. She didn't conspire to kidnap any. Tammy Moore's case was definitely more difficult than Sydney's case. We didn't have her on video at Walmart. We didn't have her making a payphone call. Even that evidence hadn't been enough to convict Sydney. So for Tammy's trial, prosecutors realized they had to essentially redo their presentation of the case. I knew we could do better. When you collect evidence, police normally focus on that very tight time that she goes missing at. But we started looking at a much larger time frame. Prosecutors tracked Sydney and Tammy's movements all over town before, during, and after Heather's disappearance. And what they found was damning. After Tammy found out about this affair, they literally stalked Heather Elvis. They were chasing her, basically watching her to find out when she may be the most vulnerable. And based on this analysis, prosecutors were able to secure a second indictment for conspiracy to kidnap on top of the kidnapping charges they already had. We really decided we are showing these jurors everything we've got. And this time the state calls Jody Davenport. The key witnesses really were those individuals that knew that she was dating Sydney Moore and at the time she thought she was pregnant. Do you know who she was having sex with? Sydney. Who was she scared of? Tammy. 
had never been face to face with Tammy up until that point. Who's in this picture? That's Heather. You know, I'm giving my testimony and I'm speaking and being questioned. And how did she feel about Sydney? She loved him. And she's staring into my eyes and she she has this way of being very, very intimidating. I, I mean, I get goosebumps still thinking about it to this day. Tammy Moore was an extremely dominant, controlling person. She takes his phone. He can't work at the Tilted Kilt any longer. She even chains him to the bed at night. I'm not speaking figuratively to you right now. Literally chains him to the bed at night. The prosecution also alleges that Tammy forced Sidney to get a tattoo of her name on his body. And the state calls Jacob Melton. And they brought to the stand a friend of their son's to testify about what he heard Tammy tell Sidney. If you were to have messed with that girl, this wouldn't have been happening. And she was referring to what, the tattoo? Yes. Okay, and where was it located on Sidney? On his lower front waist. While the defense didn't deny the existence of the tattoo, they insisted that Sidney had gotten it long before he had met Heather. In fact, they presented photos of the tattoo in process during trial. The whole idea behind the tattoos and the handcuffing is to show Tammy's control over Sydney. The whole prosecution theory is that she grew so jealous over Heather that the two of them conspired to kidnap her. Eventually, Heather and her friends come to the realization she might be pregnant. When this gets out and becomes common knowledge, the fire, the jealousy, that is in Tammy Moore explodes into utter rage. This is where the plan starts. This is where the conspiracy is born. But while there seemed to be plenty of motive, what the case lacked was the kind of direct evidence that juries often rely on. Testimony and evidence will show that Tammy and the missing woman were never together. Everything we had was circumstantial. But the circumstantial evidence we had, I don't think, could be contradicted. Time the state calls Mike Nelson to the stand. We provide the software that analyzes cell phone records during investigations. We were able to visually show the jury where they were based on the phone records. So we can see how the phone uses different towers over time. So you use it basically to show the phone's movement? Yes, ma'am. Tammy and Sydney, both of their phones began following around Heather Elvis's phone after November 2nd. So that places Heather's phone up there that evening. Also on that same evening that we have Tammy's phone on the Sprint network. And now also Sydney Moore. Sydney Moore's phone is up there as well, yes. And on the night of December 18th, both Sydney and Tammy's cell phone pinged on the same tower near the payphone, proving they were together that night. And it's Tammy and Sydney's phone in the area of this payphone at one thirty. Yes, they are. Immediately after that phone call, she calls her roommate. My exact words were, do not call Sydney back. Don't do anything rash. Go to sleep and we'll talk about it tomorrow. When is the next time that you heard from her? I haven't. In a week like this, it's almost like you're just drowning. So when you have moments like that, you have to reach out and hold on to other people because it's hard. Um, the world kind of swallows you up. When prosecutors presented video surveillance footage showing that Ford F-150 driving back and forth from Peachtree Landing just before and just after Heather disappears, they were actually able to call a person who teaches forensic video analysis at Quantico. The work that we do includes the help with questions of primary identification. He looked at the Morris truck and looked at the video, analyzed all sorts of headlights, testified about different types of trucks and the way their headlights work. Is it your opinion today, after looking at everything you've looked at, that indeed it was the same truck as the known truck, which belonged to Tammy Moore? Yes. When the state rested, they excused the jury. It was pretty clear Tammy wanted 
to say something. She is so narcissistic, I don't think she could help it. All right, then do you wish to testify in this case? I do not. When she said, yes, I want to testify, there was a gasp in the room. There's no doubt Tammy Moore thought I can convince this jury that I've done nothing wrong. So help me God. Thank you. Please be seated. These were Facebook posts, triple coupons, follow, school's all done. So it looks like you are putting together a timeline. It starts with early in the night at 147, my sister texts me. 310, I pull into the driveway. I text her, I got the ad, and then I'm home. 358, I make another post, and this is conversations that me and Sydney had that night. So I just, I wanna make sure that everything that I did was accounted for, that it's looking normal, just like any other day in my life. I was surprised when Tammy Moore decided to sit down with me for an interview in violation of a court-imposed gag order on her the night before she was expected to take the stand in her own defense and without her attorney present. What we got accused of, neither one of us would ever do. Which part? The kidnapping. And at first, it was murder as well. And that's not, we're not those kind of people. I've never even had a speeding ticket. I didn't even have sex till I was 18 years old. There are people who say that you were the pants in the family, that you were really the powerhouse here. The so, man that makes the money is the one that's running the house. I paid the bills. And the wife who gets her name tattooed on her husband's stomach, that was right his above idea. the belt, that was his seems idea. to be the one who makes the rules. But that's making it sound like he got a tattoo because so I this... forced him to and I didn't. Okay, so since we're on that <laughs> subject, after he had the affair, with Heather, did you actually handcuff him to never, the bed? Never. It sounds like you're trying to hide or cover up something that seems completely natural, which is anger resulting from your husband cheating on you. I'm not mad at her. I am pissed at him because he's not being honest with me. Yet the prosecution essentially alleged in the beginning that you were angry enough that your husband cheated on you, that you were ready to kill. That's what they say, and they're wrong. Were you angry enough that your husband cheated on you that you were ready to kidnap? Absolutely not. It seems that the prosecution to some degree thinks that you are the linchpin here, not Sydney. They change it according to what they need to say. It seems like everybody is lying here, except you. And Mike. that's why I am terrified of tomorrow, because I feel like this town is going to crucify me because of all the lies and all of the that's happened. What happened to Heather Elvis? Well, after more than a week, the state has rested its case. Today, Tammy Moore took the stand in her own defense. You're right, this time the defense calls uh, Tammy Moore. Please raise your right hand. There's no doubt Tammy Moore, when she took the stand, thought, I'm going to be running this courtroom while I'm up here. Please help you, God. So help me, God. I had never heard her voice in person before. Did you learn? who he was having an affair with. Not until the girl called me back and told me who she was. I had no idea. So the messages were never directed towards Heather Ellis. Every time that woman used my daughter's name, it was like stabbing me with an ice pick. And did you feel like you had a right to know who it was? I did. I didn't go about it the right way, and I'm sorry for that. It looks bad, but I just wanted to know who it was. That's all. Uh, you've been known to use some pretty salty language, haven't you? Right. She sat there and smiled the entire time. She batted her eyelashes, and it just seemed like she was an actress putting on a play. Tammy thinks, in my opinion, that no matter where she's at, she's the smartest person in the room. Do you know what time 0800 is? 8 o'clock a.m. You had to worry, was the jury really going to buy this? Did you kidnap Heather Ellis? No, I did not. Do you know who kidnapped her? I do not. Do you know if she's been kidnapped? I do not. When Tammy first took the stand, she came across very credible. 
But I think we, through the evidence, already knew that there was a different side of Tammy Moore. Almost immediately, it got contentious between Nancy Lysay and Tammy Moore. Ms. Moore, do you know who I am? I do. Okay, and who am I? Nancy Lysay. You've made my life miserable. She came off the cuff and was saying I had ruined her life. So I knew for her it was very personal. I think it was the next day she called. It was a nice conversation. She was a nice girl. She wasn't mean to me. I wasn't mean to her. It took very little to push her buttons. And you've said on 11-11, I think the bitch is in high. And that what you said? It's on there. Okay. Then what makes you think the bitch is in high? I was just being a jerk at the time, I guess, Nancy. That's all I can say. Have we ever met outside of this courtroom? I don't think so. Okay. I just didn't know when we got on a first name basis. That had to be the first defendant that had called me by my first name. I felt like that was a almost power play on her part. Me and you are equal, and I'm going to be controlling the temperament of these questions and answers. Ms. Moore, would you agree that the testimony has been that the truck went down there on 814 and Mill Pine? A truck, not my truck. But have you been in here for the testimony of the time of the video? People lie, Nancy. I think Tammy Moore is filled with such anger, rage, and arrogance that she couldn't help herself. Tammy's text and social media posts could account for every single minute, except for what seemed to be most critical, the time around 3.41 a.m. when Heather's cell phone went off the grid. Is there anything you have called on your phone, texted on your phone, or posted on Facebook at 3.35? I, I don't think so. Okay. How about at 3.40? Um, there's, I don't think so. How about 3.45? I don't know. If that's what you're saying to people, I don't I don't know what time a truck went there. The one person in this room that knows what happened to Heather Elvis already told you from the stand. She said Heather was a nice girl. She already knows something that I don't know that this family is uncertain about, I'm asking the 12 of you to look at the evidence and give 
this young woman and this family the ending that they deserve. It was such a contentious trial, I didn't know what the jury was going to do. The jury was at a very short amount of time. Prosecutors feel like that's never good for us. Thousands of you watched online for the past two weeks as the state laid out its case against Tammy Moore. Today, the jury returned a verdict. I think the moments leading up to the verdict probably took five years off my life, I feel like. It was very stressful. Deliberations lasted for four hours. But when we found out that we had a verdict, um, anxiety, I was nervous. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a jury's reached verdict. Is that correct? Yes, sir. I, I just, uh, just closed my eyes and kept them closed. I was, I was almost afraid to open them. We, the jury, find the defendant, Tammy Case and Moore, guilty of conspiracy kidnapping. There you see it, Tammy Moore hugging her family minutes before the judge sentenced her to 30 years in prison. Shortly after, officers escorted her to J. Rubin Long Detention Center. I felt so relieved, but I just felt like it wasn't enough because the way that Tammy has this smile and this look on her face made me realize I, I don't think she will ever say what she did to Heather that night. They feel no remorse. They won't, they won't tell us anything we want to know. Uh, it's always somebody else's fault. Even though Tammy Moore's trial is over, the Elvis family have to still go through the trial of Sydney Moore. The retrial there is still pending, so, you know, we, we've got to wrap our heads around that. After Tammy was convicted in October of 2018, we retried Sydney in September of 2019 for the same thing. We can't give justice to Heather Elvis by giving an injustice to another citizen like Sidney Moore. We're gonna show you that this man right here, Sidney Moore and his wife, Tammy Moore, conspired, planned, and executed that plan to kidnap Heather Elvis on December 18th of 2013. You can't abduct somebody, you can't do all the things they're saying they're doing and not leave some trace of physical evidence. I had to make sure the jury understood that circumstantial evidence was just as effective, just as telling as a confession would be. The defense very well may dwell on the fact that this is a circumstantial kind of case. Most cases in criminal law, ladies and gentlemen of this jury, are circumstantial evidence. I think there were a lot of uh, pieces of evidence that pointed to the direction of the Moors, but for me, the defining moment in this case was the testimony of Donald D. Marino. And the evidence you're about to give the court in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you guide. Thank you. Donald D. Marino is Tammy Moore's cousin, and he is a convicted criminal with a rap sheet. But he said back in 2014, Sydney showed him a very disturbing photo. Did he show you anything? Yeah. Tell this jury who that picture was of. I had that with he told us he had seen a picture of Heather Elvis on the phone. She was clearly not alive, and there was blood on her shirt and scratches on her face. In that picture, did Heather look like she was under her own free will? No. At that time, the judge would not have allowed us to get into the details of the photo because we were only trying them for kidnapping and not murder. Let me ask you this. After seeing that picture of Heather back in 2014, do you expect this family to ever hear from her again? No. Donald D. Marino, frankly, didn't have to testify. He didn't have to tell anybody what he saw. Tammy Moore was his cousin, and the last thing he wanted to do was go against family. Still, it was damaging testimony, despite the fact that uh, he couldn't produce the photograph. The question is, would anybody believe him? And the defense team was going to make sure the jury knew about his criminal past. What have you been convicted of in the past, sir? I have a Beverly charge and a drug charge. A drug is heroin? Yes, sir. Donald D. Marino is a lot of things. He's an addict. 
You can call him a thief if you want to. One thing, he's not as a liar. Prosecutors confirm there were no deals cut with Di Marino for his testimony, and it's impossible to know whether the jury believed him. And that's when prosecutors dropped the bombshell that nobody saw coming. There was a video presented during Sydney's kidnapping trial that none of us had seen before. Holy crap, this is it. This is the evidence that anybody that still had doubts needed to say, wow, they did this. All well, testimony is now underway and the retrial of Sydney Moore. Both sides are trying to make their mark on the jury that could close a six year investigation. In September 2019, after a hung jury and a conviction for obstruction of justice, Sidney Moore thought that he might have a chance. But prosecutors had some surprises in store. Sidney and Tammy Moore had had a home surveillance camera system in their house, which they tore out on the 20th and reinstalled a new one on the 21st. Now, remember, Heather disappeared early in the morning of December 18th, and anything that would have appeared on the old surveillance system wasn't there anymore. But investigators confiscated this new system anyway. Once the police finally got their surveillance footage, they saw when Sydney was washing the car and vacuuming the car out on December 22nd. This DVD is a copy of the video surveillance system that was in the Mora's house. And what that security camera video shows is Sydney and Tammy spending hours cleaning their F-150 pickup truck. And not just cleaning the truck, but focusing on the rear passenger side. Originally, we tried to use the video in the first trial and we were denied. The judge felt like, look, a lot of people wash their truck. It's a new truck. That's not gonna be enough to get you there. I think that's mere suspicion. Once we went back and looked more at the footage and closer at the footage is when we found, look, there's more to this. About 30 minutes into cleaning the truck, Sydney starts a burn pile over in the side yard and starts burning some of the rags that they're cleaning with and it continues throughout the whole time they're there. So that kind of pushed it forward and at that time the judge allowed us to play it and put it into evidence. Okay. Once the rags were burned, could you have gotten any evidentiary value? No, they were destroyed in the burn pile. Like to me, that just screams guilty. The defense claimed that burning the trash is common in the Moore's neighborhood. Honestly, after we saw what was on the tape, we would have never dreamed they would have done that knowing that that video surveillance camera was there. That was kind of, I felt like, the biggest mistake they had made. That wasn't the only piece of new evidence the prosecutors put forward. Other than Donald D. Marino's testimony, um, I think one of the big moments of this trial was when Ashley Kaysen took the stand, who is Tammy Moore's sister. Tammy's sister, Ashley, was called by the defense to testify on Tammy's behalf. But who would she play better for, the defense or the prosecution? The prosecutors asked Ashley about video that they claimed showed Tammy looking for police listening devices. You were looking for bugs, weren't you? You and your sister, Tammy? Bugs? Were looking through, yeah, to see if the police had left any, I'm assuming, devices. Y'all were looking all through the tree. No, I don't recall. Okay, I can play this video and it can refresh your memory. You want me to refresh your memory? Sure. <laughs> That's what we are following. Okay. You literally could see Tammy Moore with a mirror looking under items in the house and in the yard trying to find out if the police had put anything there. It looks to me like she's pulling weeds out of her okay, garden. Okay, keep looking. What she did all the time. Keep looking. Okay, did you look like a mirror? I can't tell, to be honest, it's too far, either it's too far away or the picture's not good enough. The thing she said, you couldn't reconcile it with the evidence. Still, despite Ashley's testimony, prosecutors argued that Tammy's actions on video were yet another piece of damning evidence against the Moors. 
Tammy Moore is a woman who's concerned about police surveillance because number one, she hates losing control. And number two, she knows exactly what she did that night. She knows exactly where poor Heather Elvis is and she doesn't want to get caught. I need additional witnesses, Mr. Gentlemen. Your Honor, the state has nothing further. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, this includes the evidentiary portion of this, of this process. Even though there may be suspicious behavior that we simply could not trust the circumstances enough to say that we're uh, convinced beyond a reasonable doubt. Like I told the jury in opening statements, this is absolutely a circumstantial evidence case for two reasons. One, Sydney and Tammy Moore are not cooperating. They don't have to. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. But more than that, they lied, they misled police, they deleted records, they destroyed evidence. And I am here to ask you at the end of this story to give justice to this family and this community. These people have been patient and persistent. And I'm asking you to give them the ending to this story that Heather Elvis deserves. I'm asking you for justice. Thank you. It's been 2,093 days since Heather Elvis could wrap her arms around her father, Terry, could kiss her mother, Debbie, and tell her little sister, Morgan, that she loves her. After six years, multiple trials, three convictions, and a lot of heartache, the Elvis family braced themselves for the verdict. As for the prosecutors, Nancy Livesay and Chris Helms, all they could do was wait and hope. I understand the jury has reached the verdict. Yes. If you would pass the verdict, it would be wrong. I was, frankly, more confident going into these deliberations than I was during Tammy's trial. I had confidence that these people would do the right thing. I think the mastermind is Tammy Moore, but I don't for one minute think that she is any more guilty than Sydney Moore. I think they were equal participants. The verdict came back after two hours of deliberation this time. Literally half the time they deliberated for Tammy's trial. I've asked the board to stand. You may publish the verdict. Thank you. We, the jury, by unanimous consent, find the defendant, Sidney St. Clair Moore, on the charge of kidnapping, guilty. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Like Tammy, Sydney was also sentenced to 30 years on each charge to run concurrent. Do I feel he was wrongfully convicted? I mean, I feel the, I feel the jury got it wrong, uh, not implying any necessarily any type of malfeasance or bad acts or anything of that nature, but you know, I, I feel they did get it wrong. They tried to raise these reasonable doubt, and that was their job, to raise reasonable doubt. But they didn't do their job, because I wasn't doubting. Were you? No. I know the right people are behind bars. I have no doubt about that. The perfect solution would be to find Heather Elvis alive, but I don't believe that'll ever happen. I think eventually one of them will turn. I think 30 years is a long time. I think once they find out that their appeals are denied, I think then they will be looking to tell the truth. After the verdict, I think the emotions that everyone felt were empty. There was no reprieve from the heaviness that's there because we don't know where Heather is. Yeah, for six years now, they've met at Peachtree Landing in Sockasty. This event brings other families who have lost loved ones or are missing loved ones during a time of year when family really means the most. If I could talk to Sydney, I would want to tell him that this has been just a really long night. Sydney sees this and he remembers what it's like to care for her. At some point, Sydney loved her. 
do I really think that'll happen? Deep down, no, I don't. Wait, I'll never give up. I think that at 20 years old, you're looking for someone to love you. That somebody out there wants to love you unconditionally and walk away from everything in the world for you. I know how happy she would have been that somebody loved her and she had this fairy tale ending, but she didn't. She didn't have that fairy tale ending. 